Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the, this Dean's discussion. Uh, it's wonderful to see um, your faces popping up on my screen. I'm sorry we can't do this uh, live in the Malkin Penthouse, but um, I'm pleased that we can gather together in this way. Uh, as you, I think you know, the, the theme of the Dean's discussions for this fall is different ways of achieving social change. Um, we teach, do research, engage with practitioners uh, on a number of different channels through which uh, we and other people who care about the state of the world can try to make a better world, uh, can achieve outcomes for people's lives uh, that are better than the ones that they have today in this country and around the world. So we've divided up these Dean's discussions into a session we had a few weeks ago about how to achieve uh, social change through the private sector. Um, we are coming in a couple of weeks, I think, uh, to a session on social change through public organizing and social movements. Uh, but today's discussion is about uh, achieving social change through the governments. And I'm just uh, delighted and grateful that uh, three uh, faculty members um, who have spent uh, big parts of their lives uh, producing social change through their work with governments are here to be on the panel today. Uh, I'll introduce them very briefly and then turn things over to uh, Sarah Wald, um, who's my chief of staff and an adjunct lecturer at the Kennedy School and the Law School uh, to moderate the discussion. Um, in alphabetical order, um, the faculty members on the panel today are uh, Yor de Jong. Yor is a senior lecturer in public policy and management, um, maybe best known around the Kennedy School at this moment as the faculty director of the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, uh, through which mayors and senior city officials from around the world are learning from the faculty at Harvard and elsewhere and learning from each other how to be more effective uh, public servants. Uh, next is Jason Furman. Jason's a professor of the practice of economic policy uh, jointly at the Kennedy School and the economics department in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Um, he is uh, now known uh, as one of the uh, lecturers in uh, Economics 10, the introductory economics course uh, in the college. Um, Jason has worked um, in na on national economic policy uh, for a few decades now uh, before coming to the Kennedy School uh, four years ago was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors uh, under President Obama. Uh, and third, uh, uh, Wendy Sherman, uh, professor of the practice of public leadership. She is the director of our Center for Public Leadership at the Kennedy School. Uh, she was uh, formerly a um, uh, senior State Department official with the rank of ambassador, among other uh, notable accomplishments. She was the chief uh, U.S. negotiator for the Iran nuclear deal, but before moving into international relations, uh, spent considerable time uh, using governments as a force for social change uh, through their domestic activities. Uh, so I'm grateful uh, to Yorit and Jason and Wendy for joining us today uh, and to Sarah for moderating the discussion. Sarah, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and thanks everybody for coming to this second in the Dean's discussion. Our next one is going to be on December 2nd. Um, as our, is our normal format, we'll hear from each of the panelists briefly, and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. If you'll use the virtual um, raising your hand, then we can call on you for questions. Um, in this holiday time, coming up to the holidays, I've been having a lot of Zooms with Zoom meetings with extended family. And whenever I talk with the particularly the my college age relatives, um, government is not the first venue that they think of for the social change that they're looking for. And that's why I'm particularly happy to be hearing from our three panelists today. Um, Yorit has, uh, has uh, described government as a unique platform for social change. And so we are really going to benefit from hearing about that from our panelists today. I think we'll start with a um, broad view of the government ecosystem from Jason. Great. Uh, thanks so much for, um, for including me in this discussion. 
Um, I have a very strong view about the best way to make social change. And that's the way you're most excited about, uh, because that's what you're going to be best at doing. Um, that's where you're going to make the largest contribution. I started out, I went straight from college to graduate school. I thought all I wanted to do was to be a pure academic doing purely academic research. And then for almost random reasons, I ended up going to what originally I planned to be just one year in the government where I thought maybe I'd get some new research ideas. And then I'd come straight back uh, to graduate school and become a professor. I ended up staying for the better part of four years and then going back again um, for another eight to the government. And a lot of why I did that is I just loved it. And the fact that I loved it was related to the fact that I could do useful things there. The fact that I could do useful things there was related um, to, to I loved it. Um, when I think about you know, what I used to tell my staff at the Council of Economic Advisors that our goal was to, you know, if we could be a big part of a small thing that wouldn't have happened anyway, um, we should be really excited. Um, I got very involved in how to better allocate electromagnetic spectrum that's used to power our smartphones and allow them to connect to the internet faster. That's not the world's most important issue, but it's something in the Obama administration that may not have happened if I wasn't helping to drive it forward. And you should also be really excited when you can make a small contribution um, to a large thing. Um, one of the two largest things we did on the economic side or related to the economic side in the Obama administration was immigration reform. I didn't have a whole lot to add because the economics were very simple. The more immigrants, the better, as far as I was concerned. All the tricky issues were politically, how you navigated this group and that group and balanced it all together. So I just made some small contribution um, to the issue of immigration. I was one of you know, a bit player in the whole thing. Um, but incredibly proud that I could contribute to drive that forward, a small contribution to something um, that I think was um, quite large. Unfortunately, we didn't succeed in the biggest thing we were trying to do there, um, which was legislation. You know, for me personally, the government and for many people is in a sense part of an ecosystem. There's an economic theorist over here doing theoretical research it's super far from policy, but maybe it informs someone doing empirical research, which informs someone working at a think tank. They talk to someone in the government and they talk to someone in an advocacy group. They you know, were ginned up by somebody that went on a march and there's all these different pieces of it. And what works well is if they're all talking together, works particularly well if there's someone that straddles different parts of the ecosystem. They do two or three of the things I said or move back and forth between them. That's certainly um, what I've tried to do with my life. Um, if you're not gonna have a permanent career in the government, you'll be more on the political side, um, you'll need that. You'll need a period when you're in government and a period when you're in a think tank or in an advocacy group or in a consulting company in a business that's trying to do clean energy, you know, whatever it is, um, and then you have an opportunity um, to go back in. And you know, some people say, oh, you know, theorists are useless, or people in government are, you know, not nearly as smart as people who are theorists, or you know, whatever it is. Um, I think we need all of them. And what's really important is that there's the connective tissue between those different pieces, um, and they're in. Um, communication with each other. Um, we'll end just by talking at the level of government. Um, and that gets back to the sort of large contribution to a small thing or small contribution to a large thing. And by the way, you may be lucky enough to be in a position to make a large contribution um, to a large thing one day. Most people aren't, and that's fine. There's a whole lot you can do. Um, you know, state and local government is often sort of you can make a large contribution to something. You can't solve the whole country's problems, but you can solve a problem in a city. You can solve a problem in a state. And by the way, that can become a model. We could never have done the Affordable Care Act for the United States as a whole if we didn't have the example of what had happened um, in Massachusetts. When you're in the federal government, it's a much more crowded space. It's much harder to get things through Congress. It's much harder to see and feel and 
the people and the things that you're affecting. Um, but occasionally you can come across and do something like the Affordable Care Act um, that provides health insurance for tens of millions of people. So again, I'd come back to you know, what excites you because um, that's going to be what you're good at. And that's probably going to be where you can make the biggest difference. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to Wendy, who has had uh, several different types of experience in government and views on that. Um, thank you. It's great to be here with everybody on the screen and with Jason and Yurit and uh, with um, Doug and Sarah. Um, what Jason has just described is institutions as ecosystems uh, or part of an ecosystem, and I could not agree more. Anything I have helped to get done in government to bring about real changes has happened because of government actors, outside mobilizers who might be NGOs, business, activists, think tanks, uh, Congress and the courts, either for me or against me, along with a very heavy dose of public opinion, uh, which matters a lot in politics and getting things done when you work in government at whatever level. It's also taken leadership. Uh, courage, a use of power for social good, uh, persistence, working with a team. I, I tell students all the time, nothing that has gotten done of any worth was done by a single person. Maybe led by a person, but generally happens because of an enormous team of people helping to make it happen. And I always tell people as well that social change, wherever you try to create it, is not for the faint of heart. It is a very hard process. It is very hard work. And as John Lewis said, uh, it is about the arc of history. It is not linear. Uh, one has to quite uh, persist. Um, I've been very lucky or unlucky, depending upon your point of view, uh, but I've worked everywhere. Uh, I've been in government. I've been in business. I actually started international global consulting business. I've uh, been chair of a board of an NGO and worked with NGOs. I've worked on Capitol Hill. I've worked as an activist uh, in the streets, uh, in politics and in campaigns. Uh, but let me give you some government examples at different levels. Uh, I started my career as a social worker. I have a master's in social work as a community organizer uh, and as a clinician. I only half joke those clinical skills have been very useful with dictators and members of Congress. Uh, so I took my organizing skills and my clinical skills at a very young age and was asked to be the director of child welfare for the state of Maryland. It was quite ridiculous to give me that responsibility, uh, but nonetheless, I had it. I learned that I needed a team of people and had a phenomenal boss who was secretary of human resources for the state, the first African-American woman to hold that job. And so we worked very closely together and we made social change. Just one example, we made it possible before there were ever civil unions, before there was let alone marriage, that gay parents could adopt children or foster children. Until that point, it was not possible to do. And so there were gazillions of children trapped in the foster care system who are eligible for adoption and no people to adopt them. And we said to ourselves, excuse me, there are parents out here, individuals or partners who would be fabulous, fabulous parents for these kids. So we made that change in government and it changed the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of children. I was in Congress um, just a few years later working as chief of staff for then Congresswoman Mikulski. Um, so I was in the congressional branch of our government and working with her, she helped to change the rules at the National Institutes of Health. Up until then, virtually every medical study was done only with men and predominantly white men. And she, working with other members of Congress, but led by her and with my help, we changed that so that medical studies had to include women. And we have all seen the disparities in COVID-19 
and this disparities and comorbidities that still exist in our country. But it takes little things like that, as Jason said, that you might not think make a big impact. But imagine figuring out whether a vaccine would only be tested on men, which was the case at that time. Then through politics, again, working in the political system to influence government, I ran her campaign to be the first Democratic woman ever elected in her own right. Again, changing what government meant. And then in a very small way, as a uh, first Democratic woman elected, she went to Bob Byrd, who was then the majority leader of the Senate, and said, you know, it gets cold here in the winter. I'd like to wear pants. And Bob Byrd agreed that she could wear pants. And every woman staffer in the United States Congress is forever grateful to Barbara Mikulski because as a senator, she made social change. She allowed women uh, to wear pants and stay warm. Then I had the great privilege of working both in the Clinton administration and in the Obama administration. In the Clinton administration for both Secretary Christopher and for Secretary Albright. Uh, I had a little bit of a small role behind the scenes to ensure Secretary Albright would be the first woman Secretary of State. I give the most weight to uh, President Clinton and to then the First Lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton, who had a little bit to do with that, to say the least. During that administration, working with Secretary Albright, I played a small role in bringing together a Middle East team to try to make progress on Middle East peace. We never got to the end, but we got someplace. And we all know all of the setbacks since to a two-state solution. But we set out a framework that made that real and have tried to continue to keep that in front of policymakers. I hope it comes back in front of policymakers again uh, in a Biden-Harris administration. And then with President Obama and Secretary Kerry, I also worked for Secretary Clinton, along with an extraordinary team. Uh, we negotiated both getting declared chemical weapons out of Syria, which yes, in the end, it turned out there was chlorine and some other weapons that were undeclared, but we saved the lives of thousands of Syrians by getting declared chemical weapons out of Syria. And then of course, with an amazing team, uh, leading the day-to-day -day negotiating team to get the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal, which of course is now in a different shape. So you have to persist, you have to keep at it, but we set the standard, we set a frame for what was possible. So then to, and of course, uh, President Obama moved forward with the Paris Climate Accord, which made an enormous difference and set a frame for where we need to go on climate, though we have a very long way to go. So to finish up, in all of these efforts, I just want to emphasize that change for good can happen in government. Uh, public servants every day serve us to make those changes we know nothing about. Whether it is help a group of students get their visas to come to the United States to study so that we all know each other better and the world can be a better place or it's trying to get peace and security, or it's someone at the state level making a difference for a child or a family, there's always push and pull, there's always backwards and forwards, but if you're persistent, you can get a lot done. The same is true all over the world. I know there are international students on here, and I hope in the discussion we can get to some of the cases of other countries around the world, or I'm glad to put some of those cases on the table, but I'm really delighted to have this discussion. On to Yorick. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Very helpful. Um, all right, Yorick's now going to bring us to a different scale, which is cities, but the incredible impact um, that can happen there. So, Yorick. Sarah, right, and, um, and thank you, Doug. And uh, it's great to be here uh, with um, Jason and Wendy. And let me also start by saying, you know, where I come from. Geographically speaking, I come from the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, I've been here at Harvard for about 12 years. 
And um, my first encounter with city government was at the kitchen table. My parents were both social workers for a medium-sized city where I grew up. And I heard firsthand from them at the dinner table or the kitchen table where uh, governments could make a difference in the lives of people, particularly the most vulnerable uh, uh, residents. And um, my parents worked with uh, welfare to work um, recipients and, and uh, with immigrants and with people who uh, wouldn't be able to have the same opportunity without city government. Now, obviously, uh, not all uh, city governments work alike and all over the world, there's different roles and responsibilities and, and authority and resources that they have to put to work. Uh, but there are there's something really remarkable about cities. Um, I didn't uh, end up working with cities uh, uh, until I've uh, had the experience until I had the experience of working in many different levels of government. Started at the national level, worked at the regional level, uh, at the European level. Um, then I became a social entrepreneur for a while. Um, I worked in the private sector, uh, did a, a tech startup at the end of the 90s. And in a way, I have the reverse career tra trajectory uh, of uh, Mark Zuckerberg because he started at Harvard and dropped out and then went on to become a tech giant. And I uh, started as a tech startup and then a lot happened and ended up at Harvard. But I wouldn't want to switch with Mark Zuckerberg at this time uh, at all uh, because I really love the job that I'm doing with uh, mayors. And, uh, a few years ago, uh, the Kennedy School and the Business School got the opportunity to create the world's first program that uh, at a large scale brought together uh, city leaders, and that's mayors, but also their senior staff, uh, to think about the conditions under which city government can make the most difference uh, in the quality of life of people. And so when uh, people have a... Um, uh, not so favorable impression of government. It could be, can be slow, bureaucratic. It can be, you know, highly politicized. It can be ineffectual. It can be um, irresponsive to social needs. I encourage you to also think about all the cities that uh, stand out uh, in being faster and more responsive and more creative in finding solutions. And I can, I can point at uh, the year that we're still in and that hopefully soon comes to an end so we can turn that page. But the whole pandemic uh, has been a great example of how uh, a federal government was extremely sh uh, slow to respond, uh, unreliable uh, when it came to information um, and uh, not very forthcoming in helping out the people who were closest to the problems. Uh, we actually looked at uh, the mask mandates and uh, the lockdowns and various other um, uh, measures that were taken. In many cases, cities were uh, faster and more uh, progressive and proactive than their states, and the states were more progressive and proactive than the federal government. And so uh, the mayors that we have been convening this year on a weekly basis, now on a monthly basis, but in the first months of the crisis on a weekly basis in uh, Zoom calls, just like this one, um, were inventing in real time how to respond to uh, the, the public health crisis. At first, uh, they shared their practices on how to turn food, uh, schools into food distribution centers, on how to save local businesses by changing zoning plans and, and traffic rules. Uh, on how to reach out to uh, uh, elderly people, uh, on how to support frontline workers and so forth. And so uh, they have been quicker and more agile, more creative um, uh, because they had to. It was not even a choice. If you are a local leader, you will be held immediately accountable by the people that are around you. And so uh, as a city leader, you're really on the hook, you're on the front line and, um, and it's a, an extremely challenging job, but also a rewarding job because um, you see the results of your actions much in, in a much quicker time frame. And um, one of the uh, quotes from uh, Thomas Jefferson is that government closest to the people serves the people best. Uh, now you can argue about that. I, I don't think that with city government alone, we can get the social change we need. Uh, but they do play a really important role 
And uh, when you think about the second uh, uh, big issue of this year, economic recovery, um, uh, there's uh, a lot of things that city leaders can do to actually uh, transform their local economy and build back a better local economy than before, uh, where the federal government offers uh, stimulus packages and the CARES Act. Um, you know, a lot of that um, you know, recovery uh, effort is not necessarily equitable. And so if you are a local leader, you know your community, you know your local businesses, you can actually identify the levers uh, that um, kind of transform the economy and not just build it back in the same, same way. And of course, we've all seen the protests uh, after the murder of George Floyd uh, and the immense pressure uh, to finally do something real and significant and systemic about uh, racial injustice in cities. And uh, we have a very diverse group of mayors that we work with. And it has been really great to see uh, how Marshall Gans uh, led uh, conversations among the mayors about how to talk about race, how to talk about racial justice, and how to talk about public safety reform in cities. And, and again, we saw in real time that mayors are finding the words or finding the mechanisms or finding the platforms to uh, try to bring the community together and reimagine what it is to live in a safe and just city. So uh, I, I think this has been a really tough year for mayors and for cities, but I think it's also been a really inspiring uh, year in, and, and a hopeful year in terms of uh, seeing the problem solving capacity. Now, nobody will say that we're out of the youths, uh, out of the woods yet by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I think uh, when you see uh, cities kind of taking the lead uh, when there's a when the federal government and, and sometimes state governments are absent, I think uh, you know it, it shows that this is a really interesting and important place to work and also a great platform to make social change. Um, the last thing I'll say is that there was this. Um, a uh, quote uh, from the, the New York mayor, uh, LaGuardia, uh, who served as a New York City mayor from 33 to 45. And he said, there's no Republican or Democratic way to pick up the garbage. I disagree. Um, and it's not just I who disagree. The Boston Globe did an investigation. And, uh, you know, like if you live in a low income neighborhood in Boston, it does take longer for the trash to get picked up or for your potholes to be fixed. Uh, so. There's, this, there's a misconception that what city government does is only kind of technocratic uh, delivery of services. No, there are real important political choices to be made. Uh, and, and the best city governments are more effective, more efficient, but also more equitable in the way they make choices, in the way they structure their services and so forth. And if you saw the 60 Minutes interview with President Obama last week, uh, the quote that made me most happy is, that he said, when you start getting to the local level, um, mayors, county commissioners, et cetera, they've actually got to make real decisions. It's not abstractions. It's like, we need to fix the road. We need to get the snow plowed, but we also need to make sure kids have a safe playground to play in. At that level, I don't think people have that kind of visceral hatred. Uh, and that's where we have to start in terms of rebuilding the social trust we need for democracy to work. So I thought it was uh, from a former president, a really great, um, uh, a great uh, encouragement uh, for, for local leadership. And um, yeah, let me stop there. Back to you, Sarah. Um, great, we'll open up for questions in just a moment. First, let me just ask to Wendy, do, Wendy Yard and Jason, do you have any comments, additions, anything to what the other panelists said? Want to disagree, agree, yep. I sort of get to the questions. Okay. Um, all right. Um, if we could, uh, if you could raise your hand virtually, and I'll remind you what makes a good question at the Kennedy School, which is um, identify yourself, one question, and it ends in a question mark. So um, the first question is from uh, Valeria. Do you want to? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, my name is Valeria. I am an MPAD student. Uh, I was wondering, Ambassador Sherman mentioned the importance of uh, the importance of public opinion when you want to make change in the government. Uh, 
And I'm wondering if you could give us some examples of how to change public opinion, especially in these uh, times when there is so much polarization. Thank you. So um, it's hard to do sometimes, but I'll give you um, a couple of different examples. Um, when we finished the Iran nuclear deal, we had to get it past Congress. They had to vote on it. It was actually a negative vote. I won't go through the technicalities of what kind of a vote it was. But nonetheless, we had to ensure that everybody would get on board. Uh, so we set up a peace room, not a war room, but a peace room at the White House to um, get out to every local uh, state, uh, get to the media in that state, get to the media that affected the senator in that state, um, get to the groups and organizations who believed in what the president was doing to communicate to that senator, to educate that senator. You're not allowed to lobby per se when you're in the US government, but you can educate voters. Uh, we traveled to states to do press and to meet with local groups. Um, it is just, it's an enormous amount of work uh, to do that. Uh, I give you another very different example quickly. Uh, way back in the Clinton administration, um, the United States engaged in supporting Haiti. And we, in fact, uh, sent some of our military there to make sure that their military junta would leave and that democracy would be possible for Haiti. And everybody on Capitol Hill said, we had, we had to have an exit date. We had to have an exit date. And we thought if we had an exit date, the junta would just wait us out. And so uh, Sandy Berger, who's now passed away, was the national security advisor at the time. And he said, absolutely not. We, we don't want an exit date because then we won't be in control. Uh, so let's put together bipartisan leaders like Colin Powell and Sam Nunn, who were considered opinion leaders at the time, to go in front of Congress, go in front of the press, make the argument that that's the wrong thing to do. And we all, want, a lot of us wanted to take the easy way out, set an exit date. Uh, but we worked hard at a public effort, a public campaign, just like you do a political campaign, to change people's mind. And we won that, we won that argument. So it, it, is, it is like running a political campaign. Uh, it takes enormous, enormous effort. And now you all live in digital space, which is fantastic for mobilization. Uh, not as great as Cornell Brooks told my public policy class the other day, not as good for getting policy accomplished great for mobilization. So for you, you have all kinds of new tools and you have to figure out the best way to use those tools along with more conventional tools uh, to change mind, change hearts and change public opinion. But it's no easy task. Um, can I just add a little yes. bit to that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I agree with everything Wendy said. Um, sometimes you wanna change public opinion. Sometimes you wanna listen to public opinion. Um, if people are upset about something you're doing, sometimes it's because they don't understand it well enough. Sometimes it's because you don't understand it well enough and you don't understand um, the concerns they have. And so it, it's definitely a two-way street, um, especially on domestic issues, which very much affect people's lives. You know, on healthcare, you might have a plan that, you know, on your whiteboard makes everyone better off, but somebody has a doctor um, and they have you know, a relationship there. And they're really nervous about losing that for very good reason. They don't trust your whiteboard nearly as much as they trust what they know sort of works okay for them um, right now. And so you want it um, to go, and I, I saw Wendy put her hand up. So this is not a debate. I, th I think we both agree on this. Um, I was just emphasizing the other half. You want to listen, um, partly because people are right. Um, even by the way, if they're not right, you need to manage it. Um, you need to figure out a different way to describe your policy, a way to add something to it, to you know, build support. 
Um, maybe you do, you can't do the best policy. So you do one that is 80% as good, but you know, more likely to pass, et cetera. So it's, it's definitely a, a two-way street with public opinion. Um, Sarah, yeah, if, yeah. I, if I can build on that yes. for the local level. Um, so, you know, I, I too agree with, you know, both perspectives on shaping uh, public opinion and, um, and, and engaging with the public to learn what's going on, but also to kind of build su uh, support and legitimacy for what you're trying to do. Uh, uh, Professor Arkin Fung and Dr. Holly Russen Gilman and myself have been working on a, a city leader guide on civic engagement and trying to, um, you know, understand the design choices because everybody has seen the town halls that sometimes we call town hells because it's a shouting match and it's not productive. Uh, but there are so many different ways, especially now with new technology, to engage with residents and uh, to kind of get participation equity. So you don't only hear the loudest voices, you actually bring out and amplify the, the quieter voices or the uh, suppressed voices. And so, so there's a, a, a great challenge in designing the right mechanisms to learn what the public opinion is or the public opinions, plural. On the other hand, there's also a role for city leaders in combating disinformation. Um, we had uh, uh, Professor Chris Robichaud work with uh, our mayors on trying to examine what exactly is going on when people, uh, you know, uh, say that, you know, wearing a mask can, can lead to suffocation or uh, when, uh, when they spread rumors that you shouldn't trust a vaccine because Bill Gates is trying to poison you and, and whatnot. You know, there's so much disinformation and misinformation out there that, you know, shaping public opinion often means even at the local level to make sure that people get the right information and get the facts and the, the, the you know, the science-based public health guidance. And, um, and sometimes that cannot come from government because many people don't trust government. So if you say, oh, you know, what so-and-so is saying is wrong, um, then you might actually exacerbate the problem because they think, oh, government is in on this as well. And therefore, what city leaders are finding out is that they work with faith uh, uh, leaders and with local celebrities and with entrepreneurs, uh, you know, with young people uh, who can then get in on that message of, uh, you know, science-based public health guidance so that it doesn't have to come from the mayor's office, but it can actually come from people that are more trusted. So it's, it's really interesting, all these new mechanisms that we're finding out uh, that are more effective in, uh, in engaging with the public on, on, uh, on, on, on these issues. Thank you. Um, next question, Kareem Sarham. Uh, thank you. I'm Kareem. I'm a fellow at the Center for International Development. In, a, in an ideal world, government is partnering with the society to solve complex uh, policy issues. In practice, especially in developing countries, there's no real mechanisms for this partnership to occur. From your experience, what could be the most efficient mechanism that can ensure a partnership between society and governments to solve complex policy issues? Thank you. Yes. Wendy, maybe. I was going to ask, Kareem, yes, yes, yes. I think you have a particular situation in mind. Maybe you could describe that a little bit better, because your question is broad and quite general. So maybe you could make Give us a case example of what you're talking about. So my point is that there are many actors in the society who are working on many problems like climate change, like economic development and stuff like that. At the same time, governments are doing the same job. I don't find, especially in developing country, a link between the two entities, government and society, to solve these problems. So I'm really interested to think about ways to get this link happening because it means mobilizing both the resources of government and, and the society. Yeah, I, I understand you better now. Um, one of the real gifts that the United States has is its civil society, uh, that we have think tanks and NGOs, uh, that we have uh, you know, nonprofit organizations, that we have advocacy groups, uh, that we have mediating institutions. You mentioned faith-based groups, which are hugely important mediating institutions because some of the more traditional ones don't exist anymore or are not trusted, as you pointed out. So I think that one of the things that 
some of the American NGOs have tried to do over the years is help into the developing world such groups and organizations to form. That's caused a whole set of new problems uh, because foreign governments don't like foreign money coming in to support non-governmental organizations. And so some countries have now looked for uh, indigenous donors uh, to provide those mediating institutions between government and people. Um, and we've certainly seen in some societies where the people themselves become mobilizers for change. And if I think of a country, let's say like Egypt, uh, where that uh, just might pick Egypt out of my hat, perhaps stream, um, where people got on the street to make a difference, they changed their government, but did not have the institutional mechanisms or the political party mechanisms of sufficient weight to really um, create the change over time that they hoped for. And so it's gonna take a lot longer, but those civil society institutions uh, are still critical to having those mediators. And Yorit and Jason may have other examples that might help uh, in the developing world. Or even perhaps, um... Here. In, the, in the US, yeah. Jason, it sounds like it's a little bit of your ecosystem point. I don't know you if you have any suggestions of how to make the connections between the parts of the ecosystem work better. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, the Kennedy School is one very, very clear example about, uh, which I think it's, its purpose in some ways is um, to operate, um, to make those connections you can't make effective change if you don't know what you're doing with the change. I mean, there may be some things where it's quite obvious what's good um, and what's bad. Uh, for most things, you know, minimum wage, for example, in the United States, should it be $7.25 an hour, which it is now? Should it be $10 an hour, $15 an hour, $50 an hour? Um, that's not a moral issue. That uh, has a moral component to it, but it has a very strong component of understanding um, the economics and the empirical um, evidence on it and the like. Um, for those sorts of things, I always think it's also important to um, you know, seek out people that disagree with you, um, test what they're saying, try to understand that. Um, don't just look for advocacy that is um, on your side because when you're making change, you know, you, no one would prescribe a drug just based on advocacy and only look at studies that said the drug was good. If somebody found a bad side effect to the drug, we really want to know. And when you're trying to make change, you know, having a world where you're exposed to information, not just that supports you, but testing you know, the, the paper that finds the bad side effect. And, and you know, that may be a bad paper, that may be bad research, it may be motivated by a corporate interest, or maybe it found, uh, you know, found something true about the world. So I think that's an important part of all of this as well. Yeah, and, and on the, um, uh, the local level, uh, cross-sector collaboration is the key to making progress. Um, when we surveyed our mayors in the very first year, four years ago, we said, like, how much, you know, what's the percentage of time uh, and energy that you uh, spend working on things that are, that are within your authority, within your jurisdiction, and uh, where you have the resources and the, and the power to make progress on your own? And they said less than half. Most of the work that we do is actually engaging the private sector and the nonprofit sector and community-based organizations to make progress. But then that immediately raises a really important uh, problem. And I think that's, that's what, you, um, what you alluded to is what are the mechanisms that support and sustain that type of collaboration, right? And uh, with the business school, we have created um, uh, an in-depth, uh, uh, a pretty sizable study on nine different cross-sector collaborations uh, in three cities. So uh, in three cities, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Providence, and Baton Rouge, we're looking at uh, three different problems, economic development, housing, and police vi uh, um, uh, violent crime. And, and so all of these uh, problems require cross-sector collaboration. Um, but uh, 
uh, the mechanisms that they, the challenges that they're, in, uh, that they're facing, but also the mechanisms to overcome those challenges. What we found in a prior study is that the top three challenges for cross-sector collaboration are one, to agree on the problem definition and on what should be done about it. Because if you, from the private sector or the nonprofit sector or the government, you look at a problem in a different way and kind of to, to scope the problem and agree on what it is and what the causes are, what the consequences are is a very disorienting and difficult exercise. Secondly, there's accountability challenges because work, cross-sector collaboration is a very abstract concept, but it has to be done by human beings who get in a room and figure it, figure it out. And so those people in that room, if they're successful in reimagining the problem and coming up with some kind of collaborative approach, they still need to go back to their parent organizations and say like, oh, by the way, we've kind of changed our problem definition. <laughs> and so it's always a multi-level game. Um, and so there's accountability challenges and, and kind of dual, lo dual loyalties that play up all the time. And then the third thing is, you know, where um, uh, basically at the level of trust and uh, a shared understanding and a shared language in which you can actually understand one another and trust one another to be there for the right motivation. And so uh, all of these collaborations that we're studying face similar challenges, but they have very different ways of overcoming that. Um, and so I think uh, what Wendy said is really important. If you have a rich history of a civil society, you have a lot more pre-existing relationships to build on. It's, there's just more social capital, uh, capital to go around. Uh, it's not necessarily a guarantee for success, but it makes it uh, a little bit easier to kind of get started uh, because there's a basic level of trust and understanding and so forth. It's a lot harder in places where you don't have that social capital. I think you Sorry. were muted for a second. I was muted, right. Next, is that what? thank you again, yours. And next question, Bill Clark. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so Bill Clark, I'm on the faculty here. Um, and my question comes from frustration about how we teach here at the school achieving social change through government and how difficult it has been for us to move beyond teaching the individual uh, skills or techniques or perceptions and knitting them together in the elegant way that you folks do, uh, have done in your presentations here uh, and so forth. And there are lots of reforms we could make, but one of them that is my question to you is I'd like each of you to tell me your favorite story, written story, filmed story about making, bringing about achieving social change through government. And the only constraint is I want your favorite story to have in it the features you all just outlined. That is, that it's taking a long view, that it is looking not just from the perspective of the State Department or the Council of Economic Advisors, but the whole ecosystem of players, uh, that it is uh, emphasizing the importance of leadership but recognizing that there may be when many wannabe leaders uh, in any given policy arena. So I'm after a, a Rashomon-like story rather than a single hero-like story. Uh, and finally, your emphasis on teams. That is, I'm interested in how, what kind of teams assembled how played what role over the long time span of this story. And I've just been hugely frustrated about my inability to put on the table uh, or on the screen for students to look at things that are as rich as the experience folks like you have built up through time and draw on in comments like this. But we essentially leave our students to have all that experience and live the experience rather than giving them some work stories about it. So what are your favorite stories? of achieving social change through government. Wendy. So first of all, Bill, I don't agree. I don't agree with your premise. 
Uh, and I see uh, some of my students and uh, some of my course assistants here on policy design and delivery for teaching in the core. And one of the things we ask the students to do at the beginning of the semester is think of a personal policy challenge, some change they want, some policy they want to have happen. And then we give them a methodology they work on all semester. What's the issue? What's the problem definition? Who are the stakeholders? What, what's compelling you to do this in the first place? What are the drivers? What are, what are some options? What are the criteria against which you're gonna match those? How are you gonna make it happen? What's the implementation plan? What, what's your rationale? What are the risks? What Brandy, are the I've taught it too. Okay, but I'm telling you, it's been fantastic. Fantastic. Um, the student, because I think people have to choose something they care about, some of our students, we just used this design last spring. Some of the students over the summer tried to make real what they had worked on all semester. They wrote their stories. And the final reason I disagree with you, Bill, is that we, Jason, you're and I, can speak this way because of our lived experience. You can't just show somebody a narrative or a story or a movie that describes a complex process and then they know how to do it. You have to jump into it. You have to risk. You have to learn the skills along the way. Leave the Kennedy School with a framework, leave the Kennedy School with a set of skills. But quite frankly, as I say to my dear colleague, Brian Mandel, I've never taken a negotiation course in my life. I learned some of those skills as a community organizer and applied that set of analytical and real world skills to everything I've done in politics and child welfare and negotiating an Iran deal. So I guess I just disagree with your premise and maybe the students feel differently who are on here, who are engaged in this right now or did it last spring and then became our course assistants. But I am so impressed with what some of the students have done to develop and then live their own passions. Exactly what Jason said at the beginning. None of this works unless it's something you're passionate about making happen. And then you get some skills, you get a framework, you get a methodology and you go live it. So Bill, um, in 2000, um, I had a meeting with a small group of people, um, including the labor secretary, I think it was Alexis Herman at the time, one or two others, with President Clinton. And um, I think as everyone knows about President Clinton, um, whatever um, you know, merits he had in life being on time and running a tight ship probably wasn't one of them. And we sat on a sofa outside the Oval Office for about an hour because he was running late before the meeting we were supposed to have with him. Um, at the end of about an hour, I looked at my watch and said to the labor secretary and a few other people, um, this could have been an entire episode of the show, The West Wing. Um, <laughs> just us making small idle chatter as we waited to meet um, with President Clinton. Um, and I think that tells you something about the difference in speed with which things happen. You could have a 50 minute arc of the West Wing where some major change happened. Usually it would be because the speechwriter figured out a great policy. I have enormous respect for speechwriters. I think they're fantastic. I haven't seen quite as many examples of them making the policy in the real world as I have in the television show, um, The West Wing. You know, Selma is my favorite recent movie of social change, maybe one of the greatest movies of social change ever. It would fit more in the deep discussion of social movements um, than it would of government. Um, but even that centers it around a few, um, you know, great people, um, mostly in, in the context of that movie, Great Men. Um, the government there is portrayed a little bit more sort of craven, villainous, forced into change. When you read history of that time, I think it's more complex um, than just heroic social movement, government, um, you know, being pushed into it. Certainly it helped create the context for the government to do it. Certainly the government dragged its feet. I'm not an expert in this whole period, um, but I am an expert, uh, not an expert, but I have observed with government that movies often get things wrong. My own personal favorite show I should say is Veep. 
Um, I don't think that's a very idealistic um, <laughs> depiction of what happens with social change, but it does get a lot more the feeling of sitting outside the Oval Office for an hour, waiting for a late meeting while nothing happens um, in a way that at least minute to minute um, is a more realistic depiction of the experience I've had. You are. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, um, uh, Bill, and I, I thought about how to answer it. Um, I remember when I had to navigate a difficult uh, issue at uh, the Harvard University that uh, Doug told me, well, for this kind of stuff, you need a PhD in bureaucracy. And uh, I said, well, that's funny you should mention that because I actually have a PhD in bureaucracy. My, <laughs> my, my dissertation was about bu bureaucratic dysfunction. And um, I, for a while, I studied everything, um, you know, including movies. Uh, that were about dysfunctional bureaucracy. I can highly recommend uh, Brazil um, by Terry Gilliam and uh, Hiriko uh, uh, by uh, uh, Aki Kurosawa and uh, Death of a Bureaucrat, a nice Cuban film. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I have plenty of stories about government not working and not making change. But um, with the Bloomberg Harvard Initiative, we actually set out four years ago to create new stories about breakthrough social change, sometimes incremental, sometimes really big. And we, uh, by the end of this year, we will have 40 new uh, teaching cases uh, from around the world about uh, people, sometimes mayors, sometimes mid-level uh, officials who, who are able to kind of uh, overcome a challenge and, and create uh, better results for citizens. And, um, you know, I think it's important how we write these stories uh, we looked at our case database and we saw that most of the protagonists were white, male, and from the U.S. And so we made a, a deliberate effort to make sure that uh, we have now uh, over half of our cases are protagonists of color. Uh, about 40% are female and uh, over half are from around the world. And so I think, you know, when you start writing up stories uh, about uh, kind of the unseen agents of change, it also helps you better understand uh, how change really happens. Because, you know, it's not always the person who takes the credit for a policy victory. It's very often the people who do the hard work behind the scenes, uh, talking about West Wing, which I love, <laughs> you know, there's a lot that goes into making policy change. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, finally, I'll say, because you ask about teaching, I think students should create their own stories. Uh, the, the teaching that I did before Bloomberg Harvard was the Innovation Field Lab, where we actually took students to the field and uh, gave them the challenge to work with mayors and their teams to make uh, to to do an innovation. Uh, in in the you know we worked for a long time on problem properties and say like figure out a way to better address problem properties and protect at-risk households from eviction, and so. Uh, so the students actually worked with the mayor's mandate to kind of make changes and, and, and introduce innovation and then had to write up the story of how hard that was. And very often they were very frustrated. They said, like, why does it need to be so hard? Why do people not, you know, welcome and embrace the new uh, innovation? And, and so in a way, I, I very much agree with, with Jason and Wendy that you have to live change. You cannot just read about it. You really have to have that visceral experience of trying to get something done and 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 failing, and then not giving up and get back on the horse and try it in a different way. And I think that's a uh, that kind of experiential learning is really important. And you can be part of that story rather than read how others did it. I think there's value and merit to both, but I think they complement one another. Great. Um, next question is from Gopal. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, my name is Gopal Nadabur. I'm an MPAID. Um, this actually builds on uh, Professor De Jong's uh, last remark. So um, once you've decided on a policy approach in a democracy, you are likely to be to face opposition for it. Uh, these days, you're likely to be attacked quite viciously at times. Uh, so I'm curious, um, and, and you're likely to fail as well. So throughout your long and distinguished careers where you've accomplished so much, what has kept you getting back on the saddle and keep, kept you going? Um, yeah, any words of wisdom to share? Thank you. Um, I mean, let me give you one uh, 
one story, uh, Gopal. Um, again, going back to the year 2000, I referenced before, um, we had a Republican Congress, a Democratic president. I was working on an expansion of something called the Earned Income Tax Credit. I called uh, Professor Jeffrey Liebman, who at the time and still is a professor at the Kennedy School. We talked through ideas about how to do this. I worked on the proposal and came up with what I thought was a wonderful idea to include in President Clinton's budget. It was President Clinton's last budget. I knew there was a roughly 0% chance that this would become law with a Republican Congress. Um, presidential budgets, even in the best of times, border on being dead on arrival. This one was like dead before we even sent it over. But I you know, enjoyed working on the policy. It was a little almost an academic exercise of solving something. Five years later, I was invited um, to a conference at a think tank in DC to, on tax reform. They said, what do you want to do on tax reform? I said, oh, I want to talk about tax reform and the link to poverty reduction. And I wrote a paper that built on that idea I talked to Jeff Liebman about, added some other things, subtracted some things, and had a specific set of parameters that I proposed there. Put it out. It was like many things at a think tank, a conference, people are tossing out ideas, policy papers. It happens all the time. You know, there's thousands and thousands of policy papers. Fast forward three years, the Obama campaign before I was on it, um, went out and announced a set of tax plans and they checked with me um, and they included exactly mine, like with the exact same numbers that I had. Um, the next year I was in government and able to negotiate it as part of something called the Recovery Act. And originally it was for two years. I then helped negotiate a three-year extension and then in 2015, um, making it permanent. Um, that policy is taking 16 million children and either lifting them above the poverty line or reducing the extent um, to which they're in poverty. And it went from something with a 0% chance of happening in the year 2000 to something that actually happened um, nine years later. Um, not everything, you know, I told you the success story. I have eight failure stories I could tell you too, um, but the success story um, keeps me going because if you have a one in 10 chance of doing something and contributing something that takes 16 million children and lifts them out of poverty or reduces uh, the poverty that they're in, um, you know, that's certainly enough to keep me going and have me toss out um, a lot many more ideas at a time when maybe they won't work now but you don't quite know when in the future they will work. And the important thing is to be prepared, be ready, you know, have the parameters to go when circumstances align themselves for it to happen. Hey, um, several of you have talked about um, leaders that you worked with or um, government actors who have been particularly um, adept at social change. I think your, maybe we should start with you on this one, but then hear from the others. What is it that makes a government agency, office, actor, um, leader good? And what is it that makes one great? And so in your case, the mayors. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, we, um, um, when we put together the curriculum for the mayors and their senior leaders, uh, we thought, well, what should we be teaching? And by the way, teaching is kind of a misnomer. We prefer facilitating learning because they, they learn from research, they learn from one another, and they learn from self-reflection. Uh, so, you know, what should we offer in that learning environment that will help them become great mayors and great city leaders? And so, um, you know, this was based on research, but also on uh, looking at, uh, you know, accomplished mayors, uh, what did they do differently? Um, and what uh, are the things that are within your scope of control that can transform the way government works? Because um, very often when mayors, uh, you know, come into office, they kind of inherit a bureaucracy, an org chart, uh, to some extent a staff, uh, definitely a culture, and uh, they come in with a platform that they ran on with ambitions and aspirations and they want to deliver on their promises, but then the whole apparatus is not immediately uh, ready to deliver on that. And so 
a lot of mayors spend their first um, you know, year or years and sometimes their whole first term kind of dealing with legacy problems before they get to the stuff that they actually wanted to change. And then it's time to run for office again, right? For a reelection. Uh, so we, we kind of looked at the levers that they have at their disposal. What, what are the things that you can do differently and what, um, you know, how can you distinguish good from great? So I, I actually wrote an article about this about a year ago called Mapping the Five Genes of an Innovative City Hall. And, uh, you know, we called it the five E's. I, I will say them right now. Empathy, um, evidence, engagements, engineering, and ensembles. Uh, and uh, Empathy is about really thinking about the user or the client or the beneficiary, like really looking at government from the perspective of somebody who depends on it, right? And so when you, whether you use design thinking and redesigning uh, resident services or you know, doing the civic engagements uh, part to really bring in the lived experience of your community, uh, that, is, that seems to make a big difference. Uh, evidence, uh, the use of data and evidence to go beyond, you know, policy that you think works, uh, to um, to actually a data informed uh, approach to policy making. And so, what we're seeing a lot is uh, the better mayors they do A/B testing. Uh, they, uh, you know, they're actually monitoring uh, the outcomes, but also performance in real time using dashboards. Um, when it comes to engagement, it's uh, engaging the community, but also engaging the private sector and the nonprofit sector. And, um, and, and so, you know, the mayors who are better at creating those relationships uh, tend to be more successful. Uh, when it comes to engineering, it's the use of technology. Uh, Dave Eves has done a lot of this work and there's other, Katie Pham uh, and, and others at the school, uh, Jim Waldo, who really focus on the role of technology in creating better governments. And uh, that's not just about part, you know, being able to pay your parking ticket online, but it's also about sharing data uh, between departments so that the you know, code inspection department uh, can take advantage of what the treasury knows. Uh, and so government can be more effective, more efficient and more equitable in its approach using that um, you know, the, uh, the te technology. And then finally, ensembles. And that's basically what Kareem uh, uh, asked about uh, before, you know, the partnership uh, element. Uh, I call it ensembles instead of partnerships because when you have four E's, you want a fifth E. So uh, <laughs> that's how we got to ensembles. But those five elements, empathy, evidence, engagement, engineering, and ensembles seem to kind of really set the great mayors apart from the, you know, the, the, the mediocre one. Jason, Wendy. My Wendy, do you have a... Jason's being quiet? Oh, oh right. <laughs> um, we'll call it we'll cold call him afterwards. Yeah. I thought uh, your your list for what mayors do who are held accountable in very direct ways is a, a fabulous list. When I think of you know, great leaders that I've known, uh, members of Congress or presidents or secretaries of state. I think the elements, the kinds of elements that you talked about are, are equally important. But I also think that great leaders uh, have courage. Uh, they, decide there's some right thing they want to do that they think is a social good, that is a moral good, and they're willing to pay the price of doing it or being it. Barack Obama was the first African-American president in our history. Uh, he didn't do all the things we all would have hoped he would have been able to do. But in some ways, he couldn't. He understood that that moment in history gave him this much scope, but maybe not that much scope. And I personally believe that some of what happened in 2016 was a response to our having the first African American president in this country. I think that, um, though I've worked for four secretaries of state, 
They each were the right Secretary of State for the moment, for that time, but wouldn't have been perhaps the right Secretary of State for another time. So even if you come with all of the skills, even if you come with the elements that you're talked about, and we all might have different frameworks for what those elements are, or the skill sets, you might be the wrong leader in that moment and the right leader for another moment. And, um, you know, uh, when uh, Professor Cornell Brooks, Cornell William Brooks came to my class yesterday, he always uses the example of Rosa Parks and um, uh, Colette Colvin, I think I have the name right. Gabby, you can correct me if I have it wrong. Um, Rosa Parks was seen as a perfect victim, a perfect leader in some ways. She was an older person who got on the bus and sat up front and became a very powerful symbol and leader of social change. Maybe it was, but months earlier, a younger woman who was seen as an imperfect victim, an imperfect leader, had the same experience but was not perceived in the same way. They are both, thank you, Claudette Colvin, thank you, Gabby. They are both essential and great and important leaders in history. But we only understand that after the fact. So my only point here is that your question about what makes a good leader, what makes a great leader, sometimes we only know in the rear view mirror and sometimes we miss the people day to day who in doing what are very ordinary things are very extraordinary leaders. Thank you. Jason, do you have any last words? Oh. We are close to time. Oh. Oh. Do you wanna get in another question? Um, I think oh. unless somebody has wants to raise hand, there is not another question. Okay, then I'll just add to, you know, I courage, you know, there's different forms. Um, one is you know, a friend of mine in college really wanted to be a member of Congress. He won a special election in, I think, around March 2009, upstate New York, a district that was primarily Republican. Um, a year later, he had to decide how to vote on the Affordable Care Act. And he knew it would be unpopular in his Republican district. He knew it would make a great change for the world. I was watching in the House gallery, um, sitting in Speaker Pelosi's box as he, with his children on the floor, um, cast his vote, actually cast his votes. His daughter voted, must have voted like 40 times using <laughs> the key card. I think the system only recorded it once, I'm not sure. Um, and, and he lost his next election. Um, you know, his dream of being in Congress was fulfilled for, um, you know, 21 months in his case, he was a member of Congress. And during those 21 months, he voted for a law that, you know, his children will be proud of him um, forever for having voted for. So that's one type of courage. Another type of courage is to take criticism from your own side, because you need to compromise. You know, I saw President Obama do things related to say, you know, a budget bill, bill or something like that related to taxes where, you know, Democrats and progressives, including him, wanted something over here. And he had a choice of having it all blow up and just a really, really bad outcome. But then he could blame Republicans. You know, it's all their fault. They did it. Don't blame me. Or he could go sort of halfway, compromise, do something that actually made things better for people, but only half as much better as you wanted to, and maybe with something painful to swallow. And the courage there was the compromise um, of actually doing something good that your own side didn't fully appreciate and was mad at you for, um, when often it's easier to just sort of do nothing um, and, and blame the other side. You'll never have the activists um, be mad at you for that. So courage sometimes is, is also, um, you know, recognizing your own side won't be thrilled with you um, and, and that you need to compromise and, and make tough choices. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for all of, to all of our panelists for the, the very insightful, valuable and inspirational.
discussion of your experiences. We really appreciate it. Um, we hope that people will come to the final Dean's discussion of the term on December 2nd. And uh, I'd like us all to give both a real and a virtual applause for our panelists.